Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us on our webinar on how to meet economic substance regulations in the UAE. Um, it's been obviously a very uh, topical topic as we've had almost 500 people register. So, uh, so we thank you for your for your interest, um, and obviously it's been in demand. So, we should be able to cover off everything over the next sort of 30 to 45 minutes. Um, I've already received quite a few questions from you. Um, so we're hoping to answer that from the uh, panelists as they talk. Uh, but if you have any questions, please post them on the Q&A uh, little notification at the bottom. As at the end of the webinar, I will answer, I'll pose those questions through to the uh, panelists. And what we'll also do is keep a collection of those questions that we will then email out to everybody the answers after the uh, the webinar in a couple of days time so so please post those and if we don't get to your question then we will come back to you in due course so the format of how this is going to work shortly i'm going to pass you across to dr samir al ansari who will who will make an introduction then to alan bugu who will then go into a section and then brian con from bdo as well and then we will open it up for for questions at the end so with no further ado, I'll, I'll get started, but you will have seen uh, when you registered who our panelists are. So um, as I mentioned previously, is Dr. Samir Al-Ansari, who is the CEO at RAC ICC. We then have Alan Bagu, who is the registrar at RAC ICC, and then Brian Conn, who is a partner at the tax services with BDO. So we will go through in that particular order with Dr. Samir Al-Ansari finishing off as well before we open into the Q&A. So once again, thank you very much for attending and I shall pass you across to Dr. Samir. Thank you, Gary. Good morning, everyone. Delighted to see many of you have uh, joined us this morning. Um, of course, this is a very topical subject and we're all very keen to know how does it affect us? How does it impact uh, our business? How does it impact the uh, companies that are registered with RAC ICC? So we've tried, uh, frankly, to keep this uh, webinar as practical as possible to try and answer those questions that I'm often asked about in almost every meeting I have. I mean, how, how does ESR impact uh, the RAC ICC companies that I manage? Um, how do I know if I'm in scope? Um, what do I do if uh, my RAC ICC company is in scope? What are the solutions uh, available? Who can I go to for help and so on? So we've tried as much as possible to keep this as practical as possible. Of course, it's impossible to answer every question. So please feel free to send in questions and also feel free to contact us after this webinar because I'm sure it'll probably throw up uh, more questions for you. Um, before I hand on to Alan, I just want to uh, thank uh, Brian and BDO for joining us in this webinar. Um, you know, the, the, um, BDO, for those who don't know, have been in the UAE for over 50 years in its old format. So, so have been around a very, very long time. Know the jurisdiction very well, of course, is a global firm. So uh, we're delighted that Brian and BDO are uh, co-hosting this webinar with us. And um, at the end, I will come back to discuss my favorite subject, which is redoms. Um, and, and hopefully that will also set us up for a, um, a follow-on webinar in the next couple of weeks, particularly on redoms. So I'm, all, I'm sure you're all excited to, to know more and hear more about the practical solutions. So I am handing over to Alan Bergord, our registrar now. Um, thank you, Dr. Smith. Thank you, um, everybody, for joining. Really um, delighted to see so many people interested in this topic. It's something that I've been working on for a very long time now. Um, and we're making good progress in terms of being able to explain it and very importantly explain how it impacts businesses in the UAE um, and what can be done um, in terms of solutions. Whenever we're asked a question, our first port of call for the answers is the Ministry of Finance website. Um, they've put an awful lot of effort into getting information on the site that's very clear very concise, easy to follow, um, and I'd be very surprised if the answer to your question can't be found there. 
Um, we spoke with the ministry yesterday. They're working on a media campaign to raise awareness across the UAE on ESR. And they're very interested to know what sort of questions are being asked so that they can disseminate that information um, more widely. So please keep an eye on those pages. Uh, there's a link there. They're going to continually be updated with more information as it goes through. Um, but the key thing to say about ESR, obviously, I know you're all aware of this already, it does only impact on the relevant activities that are listed there. And if Gary can take us on to the next slide, we can talk about what information is actually available on the site. I mentioned there the flowchart, very interesting, simple, straightforward flowchart to take you through whether or not a company you're looking at is in scope or not. I encourage you all to find the flowchart on the list. One of the things with the legislation is it talks about licensees. And one of the questions we're often asked about RAC ICC is, we don't issue licenses. But the ministry have clarified that any company or any business structure that has a certificate of incorporation is also included in the scope of the legislation. So the first thing to say is, yes, all RAC ICC companies have to consider whether or not they have ESR. If across to the right there, you'll see that it is only for companies that earn income from relevant activities. So yes, you're in scope. Do you have any income from the relevant activities? The area that's confusing a lot of people is the reportable period. So the point I want to make is that the 30th of June deadline that you're hearing about for notifying is only in relation to companies that have had a reportable period that's ended either on the 31st of December 2019 or through to the 31st of March. Because the 12 month period of reporting starts from the incorporation or renewal date in 2019 and runs for a year after that. So please bear in mind that you are the notification by the 30th it really does depend on your company year. Once you've worked out whether you have reportable income, you then need to work out whether you have econo adequate um, and appropriate economic substance in the UAE. And I know Brian's going to look at that um, in more detail. Um, but again, there's guidance on the website, even though it's not definitive, over what adequate and appropriate will be. Um, you then need to look at the exemptions, if it's government owned or if it's tax resident in another jurisdiction, even though it's had income, it then becomes exempt. And if you file with us and tell us that the company is exempt, we will be coming back to you asking you for the evidence of that. Um, the next question we're asked is, um, the company is being liquidated, do we need to file? So any company that is still active on the register has renewed, even if it is under liquidation, will need to file, um, regardless of the fact that it's under liquidation, until that liquidation process is complete. Um, and the last point I want to make, and whilst we're more than happy to try and answer any questions we receive, um, we are under guidance from the Ministry that if there is any uncertainty, there is any doubt, it is professional advisors that you should be, your company should be going to, to determine um, whether or not they're in scope, what their reportable income is. And that's the reason I'm absolutely delighted to have Brian on the line, because he will be able to, um, he will be able to um, advise, give that professional advice that you'll be looking for. Um, next, slide, uh, next slide, Gary. So as Dr. Samir said, we want to be as practical as possible. And one of the areas we're looking at in a lot of detail are holding companies. Um, and the ministry on their site has a very useful guide to holding companies because the main thing you have to consider, and it's highlighted there in section four, is that holding 
and, and equity interest and receiving income from equity in companies are the main reasons why somebody would be um, caught under the economic substance. And there are various other holding scenarios that either are or aren't. And so rather than go through those now, I just take it, if you're looking at whether a company as a holding company has ESR, then that table um, is very helpful and useful for you to look at. Right, next one, Gary. Um, I'm not going to read out this slide, but this is taken directly from the ministry site. So it gives you a practical example of a company that would be classed as headquarters and also another one that isn't. Um, and the ministry site, in all the practical examples it has, has tried to balance that out, where you see that there's a reportable uh, relevant activity um, it's looking to give examples. Of course, it can't cover every scenario, but the vast majority of scenarios are very clearly covered on that ministry site. So that is your best source of information when you're trying to find a practical answer to the question as to whether or not your company is in scope. Distribution and service is a very difficult area for everybody. Um, and please bear in mind that there are two different things. It's distribution as ESR and it's services as ESR. But again, the Ministry have tried to give practical examples. And that top one about the furniture coming um, you know, from a group company and being distributed is a very common question that we're being asked. So you know, where the, the company is, uh, you know, handling goods from another group company elsewhere in the world, the goods might or might not come into the UAE, but they are being distributed, is my company in scope or not? And then in relation to services, it's a very broad range of services that are included um, in it. Um, so you do have to look at whether what you're doing providing services for a related group company uh, brings you into scope or not. And again, the ministry are providing examples of that, but please do appreciate that services is separate from distribution and services are very widely drawn. So I've put up here some very specific um, questions in relation to RAC ICC. Um, and the first one we're being asked is, the legislation says that only companies that have ESR are under an obligation to file. And that is correct. But we, as a regulatory authority, are under an obligation to ensure that everybody that should have filed has. And so we feel we have to ask every company to file, because if we don't, we'll have no way of telling whether a company that should have filed has or not. Now, we are going to apply a risk-based approach to that. Um, we're not going to be pursuing you aggressively on companies that obviously um, are out of scope, but it's much more helpful to us if you could notify against all of your companies, because that will enable us to do a risk-based review, which we have to do. We're under obligation to check the data we've received make sure it makes sense. Um, and we can only do that if we've got a complete set of data. So that is the reason we're asking all companies to file. Um, and then of course, a lot of companies should have filed by the 30th of June. Others, the filing date will depend on this um, filing within the three months of the end of the year for the notification and 12 months of the end of the year for the actual detailed report. Um, you'll note that the authorities then have six years to come back to you. And it's very important that you keep your records live and up to date. Um, and the other thing I want to mention about record keeping is of course, these are records that relate to a period in 2019, starting in 2019. So solutions that you put in place now will be helpful for your 2020 report, but you are going to be required to say what was happening last year. Um, and the next few slides we're gonna go through are the sorts of questions you're gonna be asked 
later in the year. The most important word on this slide as a, as a caveat, as a health warning to you, is that it's what's likely to be required because the UAE has not yet drafted up its notification report. So the notifications there, the actual filing of the report for a company that has ESR has not yet been uh, notified um, to us. We've not been able to share with you the questions that are going to be asked, the questions you're going to be required to file. But what we have done is looked at other jurisdictions. We've looked at the questions that are being asked in other jurisdictions. And this is another point I want to raise, is that the expectation is that there is a consistency of approach globally on this. So not only is the ministry striving to obtain a consistency of approach across the UAE, it's also striving to attain it in a way that's consistent with what's happening in other jurisdictions. Um, so we're looking for information on the activity, income, expenditure, employees. And you'll notice on employees, it's talking about up to decimal places. So there's no expectation that a whole employee is necessarily going to be doing everything for a company. And again, I know Brian will talk about adequate uh, numbers of employees later. Um, bear in mind the focus is on in the UAE and physical premises in the UAE. And then of course, the value of the tangible assets of the company will also be another factor that will help determine how much ESR is required. Outsourcing is a key part of the solutions. We really believe that for the vast majority of companies um, in RAC ICC, the registered agent is going to be able to provide sufficient resources to enable the company um, to be um, ESR compliant in the UAE. And these are the sorts of questions that are going to be asked around it. And the point that I really want to emphasize is documenting the outsource agreement. So at the moment, you have an agreement between yourself and your clients in terms of the services that you offer. If that company is going to be relying on those services as an outsource agreement, then I would seriously suggest you review the, that documentation to make sure that it clearly is documented as an outsource agreement, because that will help you with the evidence that you need to provide um, and then also don't lose sight of the fact that the company doesn't relinquish its oversight or its control over those outsource arrangements, because if they are to be valid, then the company needs to have control um, and not delegate the control of the outsource agreement. Um, but we'll be talking more about outsourcing uh, later on. And also, uh, Brian is going to talk about directed and managed, but the questions here will help you identify the sort of things that companies are going to be looking for in terms of what is being, or the authority is going to be looking for in terms of what is being directed and managed in the UAE. Um, and very importantly, it's about the quality of the employees that are, um, put into this, this, this task. Um, so the board's directors will ex be expected to have the experience to, that matches the activity of the company. Um, and the next slide I'm gonna go on to talks about uh, COVID-19 and the difficulties that companies might be having with that at the moment. So the ministry has issued guidance. I appreciate there's an awful lot on the slide to take in. What I'd ask you to do is refer to the ministry website read this guidance in detail because they are aware of the fact that with travel restrictions in place at the moment it might not be possible for people board members to actually fly in for meetings um, that said there is still a requirement for the company to be directed and managed from the uae and so bear in mind that they're suggesting the appointment of locally based directors to help um, in this and not necessarily um, saying we're disregarding that requirement. Having said that, as long as you keep good records of why it wasn't possible for directors to attend the meetings, 
um, you know, the, that will be taken into account. The other point to mention though, sorry, just start, start on COVID, Gary, for me, because the other important point to mention is that will only affect your 2020 reporting requirement. It's not going to affect or have any impact on anything that should have happened in 2019 when these regulations came into effect. So your record keeping around directors meetings, minutes and the direction and management of the company in 2019 having taken place in the UAE is going to be very important evidence for you to keep. Thanks, Gary. Intellectual property, as you all know, is a very complex area that needs a lot of consideration in terms of whether or not the company is compliant, not least of all because there is a presumption that high-risk IP companies aren't compliant and there's going to be a lot of information that needs to be gathered to convince the authorities otherwise. Um, but again, these are the sorts of questions that are being asked around IP. I know Brian's going to look at that. Um, and I just want to make the point about the development, the exploitation, the research, um, all important that that is happening in the OE for intellectual property. And these are the sorts of questions that you're going to be asked if you are wanting to rebut the high risk IP status. Um, again, I'm not going to talk to them about it in detail, but you'll see that they're looking at the income, the expenditure, the qualified employees that have been involved in exploiting that intellectual property. Um, but one of the great opportunities that UAE has, and not just in relation to um, IP, but across the piece, is we do have resources, we have premises, we have qualified employees, and we're going to find it much easier to meet economic substance than some jurisdictions that are much more resource constrained than we are. This is a key slide for you. Most of the RAC ICC companies that fall under ESR are going to be falling under it because they are pure equity holding companies. Um, and these are the sorts of questions you're going to be asked in relation to those companies. And you'll see it self-reporting. You're going to be asked whether you consider there are adequate numbers of people in the UAE uh, administering the activities. You're going to be asked whether the offices that the corporate service provider um, allocates to that company are sufficient um, in the UAE for, for that purpose. And you're going to be asked to determine that your employees are suitably qualified. It's only once all the data is collected um, and the authorities look at the data that's received and look at outliers really effectively um, that there'll be any determination or decision as to whether or not what you've put down does actually fit the model of being adequate and appropriate. Um, and we'd like to think that this is a learning experience for us all and the authorities will work with you um, to develop that uh, going on in, in, into the future. Um, we do have to talk about the downside of this and there is going to be more information coming out about penalties for non-compliance. Whilst the penalties for non-compliance at a monetary level will be very difficult for the companies to, to suffer, the actual consequences for non-compliance for the UAE as a whole, if we're seen to be administering ESR badly or ineffectively or not taking it seriously, are going to be dire because the reputation of the UAE with international bodies is going to suffer considerably if we do not um, take this seriously. And that's why the ministry are putting so much resource and so much effort into communicating the messages out on this, because we've all got to play a part in making sure, from our point of view, RAC ICC is compliant with it, but very much that the UAE as a whole um, is compliant with it. So your companies aren't suffering these penalties and the UAE isn't suffering the consequences of non-compliance. 
So that's it from me. Um, we will take questions. We'll also um, be rounding up at the end. But in the meantime, I'm delighted to hand over to Brian, um, who will take you through the practical challenges uh, from the BDO perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. And uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I, I'd like just, just like to say, first of all, um, thank you very much um, to RAC ICC for inviting BDO to be involved with this. Um, uh, we're honoured to be asked. It's a pleasure to be asked. It's a really important subject. Um, so it's nice to be able to speak to so many people um, about it today. Um, I'd like to introduce as well on the panellists, uh, I have one of my colleagues, Rona Ho, uh, who has been advising uh, a number of our clients on uh, economic substance. And what I want to talk to you about today is, is actually our, our recent experiences in in advising. So some of the practical issues that we're seeing again and again when people are addressing the questions, firstly, around um, can I meet the, the managed and directed tests? Um, do we have um, uh, adequate resources in UAE to carry out the activity? Um, I, I want to go back to this um, high risk intellectual property subject again. It's an important one. And I think it, it is one of those most difficult areas. And, and we'll talk about the common issues and, and some of the solutions um, that, that people can take to make sure that they, they do, as far as possible, meet the tests. Um, if we go on to the, the, the next slide, um, directed and managed. Um, all uh, businesses that are falling within the scope um, that have a um, core generating activity within the scope of um, the ESR uh, are required to demonstrate that the, the activity is directed and managed in the, in the UAE. And, and basically, um, there has to be an adequate number of board meetings, there has to be a proper quorum of directors, it must be all properly um, documented and signed up and those documents retained in the UAE uh, and the directors present have to be uh, directors that are actually um, capable and qualified to, to carry out the or to make the necessary decisions and, and what we've seen actually looking at businesses currently a lot of businesses are failing this test and if we go on to the next slide um, the, the the things that we commonly see are that meetings are not being held in the UAE. Um, they're being held where the um, maybe ultimate holding company is in Japan or where, wherever it might be. Also, very commonly, there is a lack of documentation. And we have, we've seen a lot of businesses where, yes, meetings are held and actually we ought to be able to pass the test, but we don't have the documentation to, to um, deal with that. The question of um, adequate number is a, is a difficult one. An adequate number might just be one. Um, the AGM might be sufficient for some businesses that are straightforward where um, we can set the um, strategy for the year ahead and everybody can move forward. Other businesses, you might need a board meeting every time a major um, contract is entered into and, and so more meetings are required. It, it is a, a slightly subjective um, point. But this is one area where if you're not meeting it at the moment, certainly for 2020, it's necessary to review and revamp the processes that are in place, make sure that there is a formal process there and that all of the documentation is prepared and kept in the right place. It, it seems to me that for many businesses, getting this one right should be relatively straightforward. But like I say, at the moment, um, quite a few businesses are, are failing. On, on that test. Uh, if we moved on to the, the next slide, um, adequate and appropriate substance. For each core generating, uh, core income generating activity, the company needs to prove that it's got sufficient resources, which means there's, there's an adequate number of qualified full-time employees, um, that there's appropriate operating expenditure, and we, you have all the assets and resources in the UAE. It's all about, is it in the UAE? Um, with the focus is though on the, the core 
income generating activity. And, and bear in mind that there will be some overhead um, costs that um, have to be outsourced overseas. You know, the, the um, um, software license for the business might be um, purchased in the USA. That's not going to cause a problem. Um, you need to take a common sense approach. And if we look at the um, next slide, there has been some um, guidance from the Ministry of Finance around uh, the interpretation. And, and, and as Alan said, there's a lot of really useful stuff in the, the Ministry of Finance website. So do look at it and see what it says. I mean, just picking out a few things though, there is no minimum standard. Uh, there's no magic number. You can't say if 90% uh, of your expenditure is in, in UAE, that's enough. It is subjective. Every business has to be taken um, on its own, on its own uh, test and level. Um, but it does urge the licensing authorities to take a pragmatic approach and, and look at the nature and level of activities. So what you're asking is, if I'm, if I'm generating the income in the, in the UAE, actually, do I have enough people, the right people to, to do that? Now, if you don't, it is possible to outsource, and outsourcing is really important. And, and many, particularly RAC ICC, offshore businesses will, will outsource um, a lot of their activity. So if we look at the next slide, just to talk a little bit about more about um, outsourcing. You can outsource to third party, you can outsource to related party. Um, it's fine, but effectively the outsourcer has to meet the same tests that you would have to meet yourself in that do they have sufficient substance and people um, within the UAE? Um, so, so, for example, um, uh, BDO um, at, provide outsource services to, to a whole load of people, um, and, but we do that from within the UAE, so that's, that's fine. That's not going to be an issue. It's an issue if you outsource it to, um, say, a group company in um, the uh, Germany or something like that. One, one important point is that the, the entity needs to be able to show that it is able to supervise um, the outsourcing. Um, so um, it, it can't be supervised by the head office in Japan or something like that. And there is a, a, a note in the, in the guidance around double counting. You, don't, you can't double count um, outsourcing. Alan mentioned that it's about um, full-time um, employee equivalents uh, and it goes down to percentages. So if you have two group companies and they share one outsourced person, then for the sake of argument, it's half a person each. Um, they both can't say they've got one full-time employee. So you, you can't double count um, the outsourcing. Uh, if we move on to the, the next slide, uh, I said I would say a bit more about the, the high-risk IP businesses, um, because this is, this is important. IP business is, any, is anybody who exploits or receives income for, from um, intellectual property assets. And they're a high risk business, essentially, if they didn't create the um, IP asset themselves and it's, it's been bought in from overseas and then is um, recharged out amongst the group. Um, which is um, a mechanism that some businesses in the past have used to avoid tax in, in higher tax jurisdictions. And that's why this is an area that um, the ESR regulations focus on particularly. Um, if we look at the next slide, if we have a, a high risk IP business, I think as Alan has already mentioned, they are deemed to fail the standard tests. And the result of that is that information can be exchanged with foreign tax authorities. And this is one of the, the, the aspects of ESR. Um, um, international, uh, internationally, um, governments will share information. Um, the tax authorities will share information um, on the businesses in their jurisdiction. So um, that means, uh, the idea of that is that that businesses can't hide away, um, for example, a high risk IP business without um, tax authorities in other jurisdictions being aware of it. Now, in addition to that, um, there are additional um, tests that the IP business needs to meet. 
Um, we'll look at the next slide. Alan has already touched on these. Um, but these um, tests are actually very, very difficult to, to meet um, because they do look at the uh, historical position. It says, you know, historically, did the business have control over the development, enhancement, and maintenance, um, creation of that, that IP asset? You need to have a business plan to show why you've got the IP asset here. And, the, and you would have to report some very detailed information about the employees to prove that they were adequate for that IP business. I think this is, this is going to create a, a lot of issues for businesses that hold IP in the UAE. However, as Alan touched on, I think in the long run, this is, this is probably a positive thing for the UAE. Um, because UAE is actually one place that does have the resources and the infrastructure to allow businesses to develop IP in the country. Um, so I think in, in future, you know, this um, UAE will be a good place to, to cite R&D activities. So it creates a problem for, for the past. I think going forward, it, it might be actually positive for um, the UAE economy. Um, if we have a look at uh, the last slide there, um, I don't want it to be too much of an um, uh, advertisement for BDO, but just, just to talk about some of the things that we're doing for, for clients and we can help clients with. Um, we're doing high level assessments for people just to help people decide whether or not um, they are carrying on a relevant activity and at a very high level, whether they're going to have any problem meeting the tests. Um, we also provide detailed advisory um, where things get more complicated um, and there are issues. And we provide a, a whole range of, of outsourcing um, and corporate advisory services. Um, so, you know, um, things like out, uh, accounting, payroll, company formation, um, all of the reporting and renewals that go around the license, uh, the company secretarial, so we can assist with making sure you get those um, board meetings and AGMs done correctly and um, correctly um, recorded and we provide uh, registered office services and everything uh, around that. So um, I will leave it there and uh, pass over, but thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I'll pass across to Dr. Samir just to uh, finalize, make a final few points, and then I'll come back with a couple of questions to the panelists. Dr. Samir. Thank you. Jerry. I know there are many, many questions that are coming through as, as, as uh, the panelists have been talking. So uh, I'm sure everybody's keen to get to those, but important to, to highlight again that um, this is doable. It's not impossible. It's not easy, but it's got to be done. And, you know, the, the, the regulations um, you've, you've seen in, in the way we have shown some of the slides, and, and if you've read the regulations in detail, how the words adequate, appropriate, reasonable are used very, very often. And that's not a mistake. That is by design because everybody understands that it's not easy to implement this, you know, out of the blue uh, and, and apply it to 2019 and going forward and so on. So, so I, you know, we have to keep pragmatic. Uh, as a licensing authority, we will keep an open mind to this. We're sure that the, the ministry uh, has also taken the same approach. And um, it is important that we do it. And I very strongly feel that it's going to be a big positive for the UAE in the long term. Um, the RAC ICC companies that are potentially within scope can meet these requirements. They can meet them through outsourcing, which we've talked about in a bit of detail. And that's where I think all of the corporate service providers, the accounting firms and so on, have a big role to play. And frankly, a lot of business to capture going forward. Um, and, and there are other solutions. So, so the, our premium product is a great example of how you can meet the economic substance requirements. I've seen a lot of questions pop up in the last uh, half an hour on, well, you know, IC, uh, RAC ICC companies are offshore. They don't have a, a license to operate in the country. They don't have visas. Therefore, they don't have uh, premises, et cetera, et cetera. 
Well, that, that should not stop you. You can meet the economic substance requirements by creating uh, a premium product whereby you've got a RAC ICC hold co and a RAC is subsidiary or frankly any other subsidiary that can then help you meet the economic substance requirements. Uh, another solution is to register a branch of that RAC ICC companies. And we've worked hard with our colleagues at, at, at Rackers to create packages for you that are priced very attractively to help you meet the economic substance requirements in an efficient and cost-effective way. And I think that is actually going to drive a lot of business to the UAE, potentially from other uh, jurisdictions too. So perhaps it's a good time to, to talk a little bit about um, redomiciliations and why we believe um, a lot of companies actually will redomicile to the UAE. One, to meet economic substance requirements because they will struggle in many jurisdictions, particularly the smaller island jurisdictions uh, that do not have a deep pool of resources, infrastructure, specialists, consultants, advisors, etc., to meet the economic substance requirements. I mean, think of the example that Brian gave five minutes ago on the IP holding company. And imagine that that IP holding company is sitting in the BDI. It is going to be impossible for them to meet the economic substance requirements or anywhere else when we think of other, you know, island jurisdictions around the world. So the UAE is perfectly placed uh, to, to receive a lot of companies from all over the world that uh, need to meet the economic substance requirements. And in addition to this, you know, a lot of these jurisdictions uh, have ended up on either a blacklist or a gray list or, or a number of watch lists that are making it very difficult for them to do business going forward. And they will look for solutions. And a redomiciliation to the UAE, to RAC ICC, is a great solution because those companies can maintain their existing legal status, can preserve their operational and banking history, can move the bank account with them, can have access to common law courts in the UAE via the DIFC and ADGM. So there is a practical solution for the companies that are here that need to meet economic substance. And for some of the portfolio that you may have in other jurisdictions around the world where they will struggle to meet the economic substance requirements. And it's very, very important that you move on that as soon as possible, because you know, we're already in the middle of 2020 and, and you've really got a few months only to, to, make, to make that move. So if we go to the next slide, please, uh, Gary. And, and, and you know, you, you're aware of this list. You know what's happening in, in, in the market. More and more jurisdictions have ended up on either the UE blacklist, sorry, the EU blacklist or the FATF watch list. And, and, and these are jurisdictions that you're all familiar with. So on the blacklist, you've got things like Cayman Islands, Samoa, Seychelles, very often used jurisdictions. Recently on the FATF uh, uh, gray list or watch list, uh, recently added is Mauritius and Panama. So more and more jurisdictions are going to find it difficult uh, to operate going forward. We remain as a whitelisted jurisdiction and it's important that we stay a whitelisted jurisdiction. Meeting the economic substance requirements is a major test of that. And that is why Alan uh, mentioned this in, in clear terms. We've got to comply with these regulations. They've been introduced for a reason. It's important for all of us that we comply and keep the UAE on a whitelist. And I think in the long term, we all benefit from that. So I believe with that, Gary, I can hand back to you. And I'm sure there are many, many questions that our uh, uh, audience would like answered. So let's try our best. Dr. Samir. Yeah, uh, there's over 50 odd questions in the Q&A plus numerous questions in the chat. So uh, we'll certainly collate these because we're obviously not going to be able to get through all of them um, and then respond to you. Because obviously as you registered, we, we should have your email address there and then we can send out uh, responses to these questions. Uh, but I guess sort of just picking up initially, um, trying to get some of the themes in the questions. There was a lot of questions around deactivated companies struck off, dissolved, under liquidation. Um, Alan, do those companies need to submit notification? So my view on that is concentrate on your active companies. Let's at least get 100% compliance with active companies notifying. Where a company is no longer active, 
it doesn't mean that the authorities won't come back in the future asking for more details. And it doesn't mean that the company might not end up um, being scrutinized and, and fined and penalized. And we haven't got control over that. So the important thing to bear in mind is if you think a company is likely to be reactivated in the future, so it might be inactive at the moment, but you will want it again in the future, it would be very prudent to, to file. Um, a company that's been struck off and is no longer serving a purpose and you're not likely to need it again in the future, no, there's no need to. But bear in mind that if a company is restored, and we hope the company will be restored in the future, there will be a look back in terms of what it was doing during that, that period. So to be safe, notify particularly where they fall under the relevant activities, uh, but concentrate on your active companies and please let's get 100% compliance on those. Okay, thank you, Alan. Um, a lot of practical questions as well. So just to use these as examples, which will help people understand a little bit more. If a RAC ICC company holds real estate and receives income from rent, does that fall within scope? Uh, no, it doesn't, because it's very clear if for lease finance businesses that it's only movable property. So movable assets are in scope, immovable assets aren't. Okay, thank you. And, and a, another example, um, if a RAC ICC holding company gives credit through a loan to its UAE subsidiary, does it fall under the relevant activity of lease finance business only if interest is earned through the loan? So bear in mind the income. The income is the important thing there. Um, similarly, I don't want to answer that off the cuff. I think it's more important that you go to the relevant guidance. If the answer is in the guidance. Uh, follow the lines of the relevant activity guidance that's on the site and you will find the answer. Uh, but no income, then it's out of scope. Uh, thank you. And there's quite a lot of questions again to clarify around reportable periods, etc. Um, so people are wanting a little bit more clarification around that. And one of the questions is, if a licensee does not conduct relevant activity during a financial period, will that licensee be required to submit a notification? We're asking them to notify because we need to know that everybody has considered it. Would you be penalized for not notifying? The answer is no. But the problem you're gonna have is we're gonna be coming back to you saying, should that company have notified or not? So please notify on everything, otherwise we're gonna to have to come back to check because we can't risk the companies that should have notified haven't. Because companies that should have notified and haven't will be getting penalties. And there's no might be getting penalties is very clear you will be getting a penalty and it will be severe but please let's everybody play their part in, in getting these notifications through okay thanks alan uh, uh, one for you brian around ip activity is the activity of software development always considered as relevant ip activity well i think um the answer is, to that is that software development will almost certainly result in the creation of an IP asset. The, the development itself isn't um, uh, an IP business, but the, the resulting um, IP um, will be, um, or, or the, uh, the exploitation of the resulting IP um, will, pay, will be an IP business. Uh, which means that if you develop the software here in the UAE and you hold the IP here, that's great. Um, because that, that doesn't fall into the high risk category. Um, so, so software development itself, that's not an IP um, business, but it will lead to the creation of an asset which is um, going to be used for um, an IP business. Okay. Thanks, Brian. Um, another question around concerning distribution and service centers the ministry's guide specifies that a licensee is considered engaged in a service center business if it provides consulting to a foreign related party and two questions what if the service is provided to a uae related party and what if the service is provided to a third party in the uae or abroad um, I'll, I'll take that one briefly but again check the detail um, but 
the UAE, if it's within the UAE, then it's not a core income generating activity that's outside of the UAE. So it should be easy to meet the ESR on that basis. Uh, Non-related third parties outside of the UAE also uh, not in, in scope. So it's a related party outside of the um, UAE that would be the trigger, but please check the detail of the, uh, of the advice of, of the guidance. Yeah, I'd go along with what Alan says there. I think that's, that's absolutely right. Um, but again, going back to practical difficulties, this is really one of those areas that, that people are having a lot of problem with. Um, but it is about, um, as Alan says, uh, foreign connected parties. Um, centrally. But do check the, re the uh, guidance from the NIF. Okay, thanks. Um, and, and Dr. Samir mentioned earlier within the, the guidance, there's lots of words around, uh, uh, you know, adequate, etc. So we're getting lots of questions around definition. And, um, you know, what is the guidance on determining adequacy of employees and manpower to meet economic sub substance? There's, there's, there's actually no particular magic to this, but, but, but it, it, it's a subjective test. Uh, and it is one of those things that actually, I think most of us, um, if we put a common sense hat on and we look at the business and say, look, can we actually run the business from the UAE with what we've got here? Um, then you, you can generally say yes or no to that, that question. I, I think in 90% in of cases, um, most businesses are able to, to make that um, judgment. Um, it does become difficult in, in a few, uh, but that, there really is no magic to it. it. And what you've got to apply is a very um, objective, sensible, um, common sense sort of approach to it. What I, I, I well and say, what we're expecting the ministry to do once they've collected all of the data on all of the companies in the UAE, they'll look at the outliers. So if you've got a company that's managing to earn 50 million, 0.01 of an employee, then they're going to look at that one. Um, and so it's going to be a case of what, what happens to be normal once all the data is collected. And I think it's only at that stage you're going to get more detailed guidance. At the moment, Brian's absolutely right. Common sense. It's almost, you know, yourself just does that look reasonable am i going to be able to justify that to the authorities if they come asking questions does it sound reasonable if it doesn't sound reasonable to you then you're unlikely to be able to convince the authority yeah i mean let's not forget this this legislation is all about um minimizing or eliminating tax avoidance this is an eu legislation to ensure that 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 tax is paid where it should be paid you can't have a French company book a billion euros of income in the UAE and have no employees or a couple of employees. That does not look reasonable or adequate. It's as simple as that. So we've, we've got to, as, as Brian said, put a common sense hat on and, and apply accordingly. Thank you, Sevier. Um, quite a few questions around um, reporting periods and penalization, etc. So sort of a a combined question here. If a company didn't meet some of the tests in the first reportable period, as in 2019, but has done everything to correct the position in 2020, will they be penalized? And following on from that, is there a process or mechanism to rectify notification at a later stage due to any oversight or misinterpretation, wrong reporting, etc.? Yeah, so I'll answer that in, in as much as um, we don't know, because we're not in control of that. There will be a white paper that comes out on the enforcement regime. So more information will, will come through. The authorities will decide what they penalise and what they don't. At the moment, I think you have to assume you would be penalised, because it's clear the legislation says you have to have met ESR, and if you don't, um, there is a penalty to be paid. We're not sure yet how much discretion the authorities will have. But as a general, if you look at the FATF requirements, one of the comments made on FATF was that the UAE is very good, you know, it's got all the legislation in place, but it's not at the moment everyday, evidencing that it's enforcing. And it will be, you know, the, the ESR will be looked at in exactly the same manner. 
Having said that, we would hope that the UAE is in a position to be able to apply it on a level playing field with other jurisdictions as well. We know that other jurisdictions have said that they will be practical, pragmatic, and we know the UAE will be practical, pragmatic. We just can't give a definitive answer because it's not something we're in control of. Alan, you're cutting out a little bit, but I'm going to ask the question that I'm sure everybody is dying to ask, and it's a follow-up to that question. So if the legislation came out in 2020, how am I going to be penalized and fined for something that I should have done in 2019 when I didn't know about it? Absolutely. And, and so what we're hoping is that there will be more evidence, uh, more assistance and more guidance as to how to become compliant in the future. Um, but we're not the people making those penalties. So it's not something we're in control of. So I can't say to you, don't worry about it, because it would be wrong for me to do that, because it won't be me making the decision. Mm. And just to clarify again with an example, Alan, on reporting, um, if a company's year end is up to the 31st of March 2020, the question is, do they need to file notification by the 30th of June 2020? Yes, you do, because it's three months. So three months of the year end, but it was extended to the 30th of June for those companies earlier in the year. So companies earlier in the year had six months up to the 30th of June, but everything three months after the 30th of June is month. 31st of March, 30th of June. Okay, thank you, Alan. I'm just conscious of time now, we're at 12 o'clock and obviously the number of participants is dropping off now, but as I mentioned earlier, we'll, we'll keep all these questions and respond accordingly. We have recorded this webinar, so this will go out on our, our YouTube site as well and uh, on our website. Uh, I don't know if any of the panelists have any final points they, they would like to make and any questions they've seen that they would like to answer. Dr. Samir? No, that's fine. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Okay. Okay. Alan? Uh, no, it's just to say that, you know, we're being as helpful as we can. So if not adverse to receiving the questions, just bear in mind that it's going to take us a little while to get back to you all, but we'll be del delighted to try and assist where we can. Great. Excellent. And from yourself, Brian? No, nothing else. Uh, it, an interesting set of questions, though, and it's, um, it's always interesting to, to hear the things that are concerning people. Okay, great. Well, once again, um, uh, Brian, a special thanks from us for you to uh, join okay. this webinar from uh, representing BDO. And obviously, thank you to uh, Dr. Samir and Alan for being part of this uh, webinar. Um, if there are any other questions that you have, please send them through to us and we will happily include them in the summary that we're, we're going to send out. So once again, thank you very much for joining us for the last hour. We appreciate your time and hopefully you've got a better understanding of the economic substance regulations and how to apply them. Uh, have a good day, everybody, and keep safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.